I was going to read from Dor tonight, but instead I'm going to read from something that's very new, uh, a very new manuscript, and it uses the tempo markings from certain composers as titles. It's sort of a dialogue, an intertextual dialogue with some classical composers and some which are modern. And I'm going to start because it's International Women's Day and one of the most incredible women in my life was my mother who um, died suddenly uh, a few years ago and left the world an entirely different place. And I miss her every day. And um, she's the one who thought I should be a poet. I did everything else first. So in a lot, of a lot of ways, I'm speaking to her. This is, to quote her, and before launching into some of these poems, this is the last text message she wrote to me. Sweetie, the kids look so cute in their swimsuits. I feel a little sick, maybe coming down with a chest cold. We'll take antibiotics and try to sleep it off. Tell Max to keep practicing piano. He is so good at it. I know you love me, but I love you more. I love you more. Last text message from mom before she died in her sleep of pulmonary embolism over an ocean while visiting Amsterdam to meet up with Romanian family. The first poem is called Dolcissimo con una sonorita acuatica. And it is the tempo marking in George Ionesco's Impressions d'Enfance. It means very sweet with an aquatic sound. Afternoon, you are my mom's maroon bedroom, the floor bearing the white balloon she'd blown for the kids. It was the last thing she blew up before dying, two days prior to the birthday party. Balloon waltzes over hardwood, humping the ground like lust at a disco, like dogs at a prom in the park. That soft dent in its side, the mark of deflation. Afternoon, I can't let her disappear with the lawn's ignored dewdrops. If this is all the yee-haw she left us, the rail comes closer. I devour two poems about a puppy's first turds until gumdrops taste like shit, a sort of freshness. I love puppies and dogs and not dying. Unfasten the rubber knot, draw the rest of her breath in my mouth. The next one is again from this strange tempo marking series that I'm totally trying. These are brand new and I'm trying them on everyone and I'm um, hoping that they make some sense. This is from, um, this is Lepthaf Marschmessi. I don't speak German, but it's Beethoven's Opus 101, Lively Like a March. Bury my face in the breast of fake lawns. Remember my head in the clouds on a creek where silver posts mark private properties, the stakes. We wade, rescue tadpoles from patches shallowed by drought. The littlest child divines godheads from dog-faced lilies. Her eyes depose rainbows around us. We spot the old man, his ponytail, yellower than a crayon labeled late sunshine his legs rumbling the lip of the park. What is friendship after selfied speciation? The light lays golden eggs as we walk. An innocent cottonmouth watches us from a rock. Your hand creeps in my jeans, warming some animal who doesn't live here, says stop. Okay. Um, here's a strange one in here that I was, so I experiment a lot with um, something Tomas Salamun does, which is sort of address himself. So what happens after, what happened after mom died was there was a sense people would say my name and I wasn't sure who they were talking to and who they wanted to be okay. So I would say if Alina was okay, sure, Alina's okay, but that wasn't me. 
So I would reassure people by sort of thinking of myself in the third person, the person they needed to be okay, which was not the person I knew anymore um, or knew as myself because being motherless changes the world entirely. So this is from a piece by Charles Ives called String Quartet Number no. Two. And it's Andante Emasculata, which means slowly in, a, in an emasculated way. My heart can't tell the sun from his symbol. Alina eats twigs after noon has baked them. The sky is a microwave oven. Alina is the problem for his extended family. His cousin says vampire variant. His uncle says speckled Slavic hen baby Soviet. His aunt says Slavs done gone been their slaves in the old world. I'm still the alien you flagged back in high school. Alina is the fake one, the hired drum teaching retirees to dance in rubber pants. Whatever she touches grows molars and turns into mud. I said mud everywhere. We could wrestle in it, but Alina eats fungi. My saliva salvages and solves. And this is not from that series. This is from um, a collection that is kind of doing the rounds right now. And it's after Ada Limon. Um, it's called The Contract That Says Maybe Later. And the word in Romanian for tongue is limba. Pretend there is a contract related to funding and your limba, your limba, that word meaning tongue and language at once in yours, in your Dracula, etc., in your orphans, in your kids not wanting to habit the losing words, their friends don't learn that music in high school. Never hear silly limba on the radio, but yes, orphans and Nadia and gymnastics and pedos, go on, tell the stars you never believed them. Ditto neon, something Ovid Kinning exile. Report the warm Southern hospitality, those vanguards of religion who prayed for you. Who prays on immigrant families? You are so lucky we let you in this room, the one about Reagan rescuing your people from communism. Now the one about communism being perfect. Maybe later there is time for the others. Skip the gift of your hundred stitched scars, the terror of uncitizened nuclear family, the generosity of privilege we gave you, we made you, nuclear and nothing else. And the limba or whatever you call it, whatever the market lacks, you teach your children how to carry a lodestar of alien verbs for rejection inside their little back. I'm looking at time. Sorry, y'all. Um, so, sorry, you can ignore that. <laughs> I think I'm gonna do two more. I think that's what I have time for. Is that right? Is two more about right? Um, I think you have plenty of time, but like. Um, so, in Romanian, there's an expression, Swarekudins, which means the sun has teeth. And it's um, like you get, it's when you get, it's in the winter and it'll be really cold, but also sunny and you end up with this sunburn and it happens a lot. It happens to us whenever we go to Transylvania. So um, this is based on that expression or you'll hear it. And the title is Andante con Scratchy, which is from Charles Ives. It means slowly like scratchy. Sun with teeth, we say in Romanian, of days with warm lips that mask frozen tongues. The left behindling, no one called me, among children who wait. An infant gets stuck between desk and the dream of running. I was crawling, exploring a homeland with bitty knees, as mama slipped jewelry into folded coat pockets 
buried two lives in one case and left me. We were talking about how hard it is to pick poems and I usually take my cue from hearing what everyone else reads. And so I'm just <laughs> reading um, and not feeling sure of exactly what everyone wants to hear, but no worries, no worries. <laughs> um, these are kind of dark, I'm realizing, you know, when you sit alone with your poems in a room, this is sort of a little bit dark. Um, this is, um, this one is for my husband and it's from the same tempo marked series. Um, from a Mahler symphony that means at the pace of a leisurely countryman, a bit clumsy and very rough. I'm not going to try to read the German for it. I own 10 mutant fingers who score your face in heavy metal moonlight. I burn time to see you inflame the night's swollen octaves. Even when I leave to write, to think, I need ink to run these eyes over your chill corpus. I save quiet to mark the depths of each breath you hold back in those brutalist purple pajamas. I am four car wheels shaving close to the curve where ear offers its byline to throat. Every separation is a link too sparse to see in real life. I will take our child's invisible horse. Let the steed do the deed in my mind. So I left out these, these tempo mark pieces are also all 14 lines, um, which is sort of an internal constraint I set for myself. Sourdine durant tout la pièce, which means silence throughout the whole piece. This is Maurice Ravel. My machine stitches fast, makes motion seamless. For years, I hoard ideologies for the promise of safety. I party for a couch, a stranger's born American mouth. Acceptance is expensive, accumulative commas. For relief, the profits of insecurity sell memberships. For decades, I pay in rear labor and weekend secretariats. For in-laws, I become an oatmeal bran muffin, easy to excrete. My machine makes stitches seem less painful. Needles snap off when fabric gets thicker. For the anthem, I find music who speaks to my tinnitus, the bells burning inside my mind. My son plays the untuned organ, leaves seven echoes, for ghosts to clean up. A sound who keeps moving isn't quite finite. For once, I dance a horror in my mama's cornea. All right. Un poco andante malinconico, which is a little slow melancholy. This is by Inescu, who was a Romanian composer. Incendiary line, be my valence, my twine, my tangling beloved. Climb the poem perch to nest at the top. Meet me there, near the tippy, with two rodents. Listen, scythians are edible. Books are the bricks who built this tower. No mammal can seduce me out of reading, of writing, of bolting the door from the inside. Oh, Spire Ogre, I wouldn't know if you locked it or invented a prison I've never once tried to leave, never sought the palace, Cotillion. Nothing to hide aside from notebooks living under eyelids. At most, I have crawled on the windowsill to read Celan, naked, ungilded, alone. And the last one is Me to the Poem at the Warehouse. And this one is previously published. It was published in Apophony, which publishes a lot of East, um, Eastern European writers. Hold on just a second while I yell at my daughter. To
sorry. Turn it down. Okay, sorry, y'all. <laughs> My littlest is full of life and very vivacious. Um, and she has lots of stories, which inspire poems. So this is um, from Apotheni, and it's me to the poem at the warehouse. And this is in Dor. It's the only one I've read from Dor, which is forthcoming in July. Me to the poem at the warehouse with a lot of different poets um, who are Eastern Europeans and other conversations in the air. Climb the hill of each other, staying hungry. You must sew your eyes open for this. Candlelight makes it look as if the hand goes numb before the throat. You are the color technician in a dream, warning the woman who was me before bleach. The unbleached inside will not listen. The opposite of ecstasy is automation. I feel something has passed. Something has shifted in the darkness like loose dentures. The words lather my scalp like a church who must service the male host first. Climb the hill of each other, of each hunger, like a show trial. Your head is the stake and the shakedown. Thank you so much for having me. Um, so I'm going to start with a few of my poems from my book, The Many Names for Mother, right here. You could order it through Kent State University Press, um, or I'll put a link in the chat. You could order a signed copy directly from me and get it in a questionable time because, you know, it takes me a long time to get anything mailed, but it'll be signed. So there. Um, and I'm really excited to get Alina's book. Can we just give a big uh, woo woo? If you haven't ordered it from Bull City Press, you should totally order her chap. I'm really excited. It's like on its way in the mail right now. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read a few uh, poems from The Many Names for Mother because they're all about women and mothers. Um, and I'll start with the title poem, Genesis. And it has my mom and my grandma in it and they're both here, so that's exciting. Genesis, the sky in June rises with horns. My grandmother's about her neck in gold and sets with Kali, claws, pincers, the many names for mother. A bull gives birth to a crab, a crab to a ram, a ram to the cusp of scorpion and centaur. The sky grows full. How many names for this? the looking up, the stars, and all their distant meaning, the many names for mother. How animal to fit inside another and human to tear our way back out. Um, so the book is full of a series of poems called Other Women Don't Tell You, because um, there's a lot of stuff that other women don't tell you um, when you're pregnant and um, just when you're a mother. And so I've started trying to write all of these things down that women don't talk about um, so that we could talk about them. And I'm just so honored to be here with other women who also talk about these things that you know, we've been taught not to talk about. Other women don't tell you what your mother will say just after he is born, after they slap him onto your stomach like a wet rag the tether binding you still warm and pulsing. And just as you look down, expecting blood, they don't tell you sometimes it isn't there. The flesh almost clean, dark moss of hair covered by a thick white film, a second skin, a part of you still holding on to him perhaps. He looks like an alien, she exclaims, giddy with becoming. But they tell her she's too young to be a grandmother and she is happier for it. Are his ears going to stay like this? She asks as if she'd never given birth herself, though she reminds you she has just hours earlier 
your belly rising like a moving mountain, as she recalled how back in the old country, she was stitched up with nothing for the pain. The young male nurse responded to her screams with, does it really hurt that bad? And other women tell you that it does, that it's unbearable, but you will bear it, that it's a mountain and drowning, that it's all worth it in the end. They don't tell you when the pain really comes, when it moves through you, a rush of snowmelt boring boulders on the side of the road and everyone stopping to look that a small part of you will love the feeling, the control to grind, as though you were chewing stones, the want to bear the way centuries have, bare and unbroken by the bearing, like the women who didn't tell you any of this, your grandmother and hers holding each other, hands and boiling water and sopping towels and feeling everything only to never speak about their pain, to continue having girls, to raise them so they know, to let their mothers be a part of everything, to understand your mother when she reminds you that you are an only child because your tiny body hurt her bad enough to never want for more. Um, and this is another other women don't tell you poem um, that's all about superstition. There's a lot of superstitions. And when you're pregnant, um, you know, there's a lot of things you're not supposed to do. So one of them, for example, is um, you can't cut your hair because if you cut your hair like Samson, it'll take the strength away from the baby. And I totally cut my hair like right as soon as I found out I was pregnant or a few months later because it was summer and it, my hair was long and it was hot and I did it. And um, knock on wood, it didn't take, see, knock on wood, it didn't take away any of the strength. Um, but then there's this other superstition that you're only supposed to see beautiful things while you carry a child. Um, and I uh, traveled to Poland in the death sites and looked at a lot of really ugly things while pregnant with my son. Um, but so this is a superstition about what can happen if you see something unpleasant and um, you grab your stomach. Other women don't tell you, it will always be your fault. His nose running after that first dip in the Atlantic, his bruised elbow and scraped knee, his hair too long, always in his face, and his face too much or too little of yours his hard hands slapping the animals, unclear, misshapen words, loud and large enough to fill any public space with unintelligible language. And then that birthmark, high up on his glute. That one's especially your fault. From when you were so scared, you grabbed onto your belly. Fear seeps through the fingertips, your mother said, down into thick pregnant flesh, down through fluid and layers of your body protecting his, down onto unknowing skin, marking him afraid. The history he comes from in perpetual dark bloom. Um, and then I'm gonna end, um, oh yeah, I'm gonna end with, um, a poem not from The Many Names for Mother, but from um, my collection forthcoming in 2023, which feels like, you know, in forever, but hopefully eventually that'll happen. Um, and this collection is called 40 Weeks. And um, it's a collection where I wrote a poem for every week of pregnancy with my daughter. Um, and I, I played with the fruits and vegetables and seeds that the baby inside you is compared to. Um, for the moms in the room that have been pregnant, you know, in the 21st century, you get an email and it's like, your baby is the size of a poppy seed now. Um, and these emails are very kind of gendered and um, cute, but also kind of problematic. And so I wanted to play with these fruits and vegetables. So this is week 25, rutabaga. Stretch marks run in the family. Looking down at your growing purpling stomach, you see 
your mother's pinkish gray ladder rungs, cracks in polar ice, streaks of soapy water dried on shower glass, riverbeds raw after a drought, a gathering of dimming stars ripple where your son's nail slid your shoulder blade. You love my imperfections, you say, the stria rising from your pelvis, pale stitches where you were never cut or sewn back together, where you expanded, then contracted down, a balloon or bulb or supernova, a body you are still in awe of. A pregnant woman changes in nine months more than a man does his whole lifetime. Her uterus amasses 20 times its weight. Her blood turns darker, blue. Skin flays without breaking rivers and rivers on her belly. It's bigger, your son says, digs his elbow in to make a valley, apologizes to the flesh. I love your belly, he says, sees the marks, kisses anyways, takes his palm and ear to them. They are all your perfections, your husband tells you. And you look up where perfect comes from. Etymology, easier to bear than skin. From Middle English and Old French, parfait, finished, complete, brought to full development. But there are still so many rivers to grow, so many months to look more like your mother, to fight your body's generational becoming perfect. The tense, a retrospective present, connects a past occurrence with a current one. Your stomach, a cosmos, constellations only beginning to glow though its stars must have died so long ago, rivers and rivers for their light to trail down a mother's skin. Um, so that's the end of my poems, but before wonderful Louisa comes on, I wanna tell you, we're gonna do a little back and forth um, about our project that we've been writing letter poems through the pandemic. Um, and it started with just saying, hey, you wanna write these letters to each other? And it became like a nightly salvation for a while um, where I got to speak to someone from where I'm from, who's gone through what I've gone through and uh, who's struggling with raising two young kids the way I am. So it's been amazing. And Louisa's gonna start us off with those. Okay, hey, yeah, so I'm gonna go ahead and read the first one, which is uh, just in the newest issue of Pleiades, if you guys, uh, like just one second, but like this cover, y'all. That's beautiful. Okay. <laughs> April 14th, 2020. Dear Julia, I won't start with the joke this time, but I do think about a story my mother tells me when she was on a field trip to the beach and she sees her father on a boat with a beautiful woman with hair darker than the Black Sea. And it's funny because my grandmother dyed her hair blonde and I still can't find a way to translate the Russian idiom about having a dick full of fish but the water only reaching your knees. I often hear the world is your oyster and I say, yes, I know what it is like to have beauty ripped out of me. My blue baby carried away from me in the fog of the delivery room. My son says he's cool as a cucumber, and I think about the bag of them, no longer crisp, slimy, forgotten, weighed down at the bottom of the vegetable drawer. Julia, why is the vegetable drawer so often a pit of death? My son pokes at a salad during dinner and asks where babies come from. And I am relieved we spend dinner talking about creation instead of destruction. Like every Jew from Odessa, I know more anecdotes than holy stories and I carry this shame and this laughter into each high holiday. On Passover, my son asks to see a picture of baby Moses going down the river and he points to his baby brother and says, bathtub? My father's father escaped Turkey during the Armenian genocide 
and married a Holocaust survivor. And I think about what their first dates must have been like. Did they share their trauma by candlelight? Did they talk about the weather? How when the sun beat down on the bodies left in the streets, one of them looked like his mother, even enough that it was impossible. Julia, it couldn't be possible. Ah, oh, that poem. <laughs> this is April 16th, 2020. Dear Louisa, here is what I know for certain. The tulips are blooming. My son brings me their heads as gifts in cold spring sunlight. He doesn't understand my anger, how effortless he kills. We'll put them in a cup with water, he says. They'll drink and be alive. If only it were that simple. He screamed for an entire hour today, Louisa, because I didn't tell him the fairy tale he wanted. He kicked his bed, screaming, I confess I didn't have it in me to imagine anything beyond this moment. Invented adventures of Baba Yaga and the Snow Queen and him, always the hero. He hadn't earned them, I said, a half-truth. On day 32 of countless stories. I woke wanting a day off from motherhood. He heard me crying downstairs and asked his father why. You know why, he answered. And the guilt of every dead tulip on my counter bloomed inside my gut. I blame myself, Louisa, like we've been taught from mother to mother, no matter what, someone is at fault. I wanted to run upstairs to tell him it's not your fault, not yours, how much we need to hear this. Here is what I know for certain, Louisa. My son's head will nearly leave his body to rest on mine. His sister's infant mouth will find my pink bud nipple effortless in any light. April 16th, dear Julia, my son tells me in his sudden bursts of joy, mommy, I love you. And I scream, yes, I love you too. Mommy, I love apples. And I say, yes, that's lovely, dear. Mommy, I love daddy. And I say, yes, daddy loves you so much. Mommy, I love my socks. And I say, well, yes, they keep your feet warm. Mommy, I love pooping. And I say, oh, okay. Mommy, I love looking at my poop. And I say, please flush the toilet. Mommy, I love the moon. And I think, yes, a poet. Like when he calls pistachios pea statues or how he tells me we love all of the people we love. And I try to hold these words in my chest and let the innocence wash over me. A body that has seen too much, a body full of joy and terror held together by anxiety and bad jokes. Julia, it is often my anxiety that gets me out of bed every morning and puts my pants on. Today, my anxiety has chosen the gray velour and walks me into the kitchen to crack the eggs. And I remember my grandmother talking about bursting with passion and my grandfather, who was a professional boxer erupting in violence. They called him the Odessa volcano and he would often talk about his sexual exploits and Julia, none of it seemed strange until my grandmother revealed her lifetime of lovers. And here I watched the soft head of a dandelion become white and weightless torn apart by a gentle breeze. May 5th. Dear Louisa, my babushka turned 79 last week and we celebrated each in our own home, faces in one screen, drinking and singing. My little cousin played the star spangled banner on her trumpet and I played something in Yiddish on my guitar. 
And my uncle made a joke about his daughter's music being patriotic of the present and mine being of war and loss, always fear and the past. Then yesterday, my pra babushka would have been 108. And I pulled out pictures of our last New Year's in Ukraine. She's 80 and I'm on her lap with a big Soviet bow looking away into someone else's childhood. My babushka said she didn't have one of those special candles to write to light. Yarzit, I told her. She asked if a regular one could work, scented maybe. It's not for God, I said, use whatever you have. Then I mentioned sacrifice, how her mother, 81, barely able to walk, chose to move continents. The escalator at the airport startled her so much, she grabbed the moving railing and would have toppled if my papa didn't lift her up. Like dominoes, mama recalls, we would have all fallen, her grip so terrified. But Babushka disagrees. She didn't have to do anything, give up anything. Everything was done for her. She didn't have to leave anything behind. All her children came. But I think how terrifying to grow old in a stranger's language on his land, terrified of ghosts that followed her across the waters, terrified of all the bones left in up turned soiled, terrified, not of dying, but of living another day, so afraid. May 6, 2020. Dear Julia, I recently read the results of a poll stating that out of all religious groups, it is the Jews whose faith has not increased since the start of the pandemic. And I whisper out into the cold air of the internet, you don't get it. My God, I've never understood the word faith, which has always felt like a dial that we are constantly turning forward and back. God breaks me apart in a hidden language. When I am so often fractured, I say the closest thing to a prayer that a Soviet Jew has ever been taught. Thank you, please, thank you. Putting on my house shoes and walking onto the balcony, my dead grandmother glowing in the moonlight. So I'm gonna transition a little bit out of the letter poems, though I actually might read one, I'm gonna read one more from a different cycle, just cause, why not? <laughs> Sorry. Okay, hold on. Um, and then this one is out of Diode, so you can read this one online as well. May 20th, 2020. Dear Julia, my great-grandmother Vera had a lily white braid and a pink peony bush that bloomed in front of her apartment. These are the only real memories I have of her as I have been uprooted for the ninth time this decade, moved to a house with a pink peony bush in the yard. My history is told by women standing in front of peonies, balled up tight like a fist until they rupture, body torn open in the sun. So we're gonna go ahead then and... Okay. So a lot of these poems that I'm gonna read are sort of a mixture of uh, newer poems, newer work, but also poems that are sort of out in the world of the internet uh, and can be uh, found by those means. Um, let's see, and I wanna actually start with a newer poem, so hold it. Oh my. You guys can hear my child screaming as hell. <laughs> okay, here we go. Okay, 
And then I lied. I'm going to do one more letter poem because this one feels very uh, thematic to sort of what we're what we've been reading. Um, but it's slightly funnier. So if we're trying to change this up a little tonally, here we go. Dear Julia. Oh, uh, May 11th. Dear Julia. My favorite genre of Mother's Day gifts is the clever coffee mug. Tired as a mother, master of multitasking, volleyball mom, soccer mom, hockey mom, dance mom. Dang, you're always right mom, world's best mom, best mom ever, best coffee drinker mom. I went to Florida and all I got was this coffee cup mom, boy mom, girl mom, llama mama, little mom of the prairie, mother of dragons, mommy dearest, and my personal favorite, home is where the mom is. And Julia, this year's mug was wrapped in a grocery bag, light pink with red letters, mom. Established 2017, written across the handle. It was the year I cried so much I could have flooded each cup in the cupboard. A therapist would later tell me it was just a bad case of the mommy blues, the color of endless water. And then this next one is uh, one that I'll be mad at myself if I don't read because it is such a ode to my mother who I uh, is clearly uh, pivotal to my work, but also um, like I, when I wrote my first book, I was like, okay, I feel like I write a lot about my family and uh, especially my mother and my grandmother. And I was like, I'm gonna, sort of, like, I've done that in the first book. Like, I'm just gonna like, all the poems I write after, we're gonna sort of, like be on like a new thing and whatever. And I've just written like 20,000 times more poems about them. So that that clearly transition uh, did not work. I think I've got more to say. So uh, this one uh, was from Three Penny Review and it's sort of again out into the digital world, but uh, my mother as Tom Cruise or as every other late eighties action hero, my mother successfully jumping off of a skyscraper onto another skyscraper, my mother hunting the predator with a cigar lodged in her mouth, my mother saying son of a bitch in the coolest way imaginable, my mother ripping a mask off to reveal that she is in fact the president of the United States, but actually no, she is my mother. My mother somehow knowing how to pilot a helicopter, my mother pulling her abusive father out of a bathtub, my mother slamming her fist down on the table during an arm wrestling tournament, my mother registering her hands as lethal weapons, my mother pleading with her mother to leave before things got dangerous, my mother watching things get dangerous, my mother holding the green wire and the blue wire and figuring out which wire to cut, my mother covered in her mother's blood, my mother, my mother, my God, my mother walking away from a burning car, my mother, an action hero that self-destructs and yet she's still my mother sitting in front of a villain, calmly explaining to him that death is almost here without sharks, without bombs. My mother pale as the moonlight, my mother watching him die slowly, an explosive peace and immeasurable quiet. Okay, here we go. This is the dark one. Okay, and then this is a, a newer poem. Imagine, you were floating in space and not in that Sandra Bullock and George Clooney looking galactically sexy way, but in that my grandmother disappeared when I was a child and I pretended she was abducted by aliens way. Imagine that science experiment you did in seventh grade when the teacher kept adding pennies into a glass of water and no matter how much grief you pour into the body, the surface won't break. Imagine your grandmother waits for you in the field of the dead. You are wearing your purple dress. She is wearing her purple dress. The field is wearing its lavender dress. Imagine being sad only some of the time. In the spaceship, when they took her, they did not call her Jew, only human, and that fantasy brings you comfort.
quoting the Bible. Tonight, I'm thinking about Jesus, which isn't remarkable for most people on Christmas, but it is for me, which means that I'm really thinking about the light from Seamus Haney's phone when he texted his wife, don't be afraid, seconds before he left his body behind. Don't be afraid, I tell my son as I buckle his seatbelt. Don't be afraid, I place a green dinosaur mask on his face. Don't be afraid, I spray his toddler hands with disinfectant. Don't be afraid, I hold him close and walk away from other mothers singing their own version of Don't Be Afraid. I say it so often, I wonder if my son thinks the words are a series of sounds. I hum when I'm around him to get through the day. More comfort than language, more shape than mouth, more memory than body, more mother than person. And then I think I'll do, I don't even know what I'm doing on time. What am I doing on time? Hold on friends. I am always this organized if you're wondering. Um, okay, I have to read this poem because it's so obnoxious and it's just, it would be off pace for me to not read one sort of absurd poem um, just for my own uh, relationship to how uh, my brain works. I'll do that and then I'll probably, I'm just gonna like read one more, uh, we'll do two poems. Does that sound fair? Okay, so. Uh, this one, it made me think listening to, you know, Alina and Julia read uh, uh, also not, not just about motherhood, which is so central to, to the event, but also just that experience of like being a mother, but also being, uh, you know, new to the country, being an immigrant and sort of like negotiating barriers of culture, but also language. Um, so this is sort of a, a poem that really centrally focuses on my dad, but my mom is sort of like this huge figure in the poem as well, because this was like, me remembering like crystally this part of uh, coming to America that was just so important. And yes, it ends on a really uh, classy joke. So the joke. My father is a funny man. What killed him the most was not being able to make my mother laugh in this new language. And no, I'm not talking about a mayonnaise knock knock joke or a chicken crossing a road, no. I'm talking about a real joke, a joke that you don't tell in polite company. The Midwest is full of manners, but we came from a culture of brutal intimacy. It took him months of study, months of listening to the men at the factory tell their jokes during lunchtime, all Pepsi and sandwiches, until he came home one day shaking and ready he sat her down on the good chair and we huddled around the table as if we were at a comedy club. You see, there was a woman in a taxi cab and a driver who tells her that a man with large feet has a large penis and a woman with a small mouth has a small vagina. And my mother scrunched up her lips tightly and said, are you serious? <laughs> okay. It's, you got, again, very vivid memory. Uh, I don't, not everything I write is like me as the speaker, but that one is, is, is very much <laughs> me as the speaker. Okay, I am going to end, um, I know, I, Julia, I, I see your comment. I've, I've practiced the, telling this uh, poem uh, many times. So, um, okay, this is uh, my final poem and I'm gonna end on, um, I, I don't have like a great reason. I just, I came across this poem the other day when I was looking at poems I was doing with Julia and I just was, it was like a moment where um, it's about a grandmother, but also so much about my son that I felt like it was, it's a good place to, to end on. July 4th, dear Julia, there are so many fireworks outside that it sounds like a Midwest thunderstorm. And I am doing my part by lighting a fuse that is attached to a pooping paper dog as my son waits breathlessly in anticipation of fire. Today is the anniversary of my grandmother Lisa's death. And I think about how my son has the same facial expression as her when he leans in too close to danger. How can I describe their faces? two cerulean clouds erupting against the night sky. And you might say, oh, you're describing their eyes. And I say, yes, but not like that. 
like taking a spoon to the galaxy to scoop pupils out of dark matter. And no, I'm not talking about eyes anymore. I'm talking about a teenage girl who ran from gunshots in the catacombs and buried her trauma underneath the buildings of Odessa. This is a story that we learn from her sister, a story that Lisa never shared with the rest of us. The one time, Julia, she almost told me, sitting in her apartment over a pot of tea, she started to say something before she stopped cold and her eyes widened into that familiar look. My son holding a sparkler too close to his face before feeling a fear he cannot explain and pushing his body back further away from the light. All right, thanks friends.